with you as we gather in the continued season of the Epiphany, the season of light, and appropriately enough, we have that nice bright sunshine uh, coming in for our enjoyment this day. A couple of announcements to uh, share with you, lifting up some things made mostly from the bulletin. Uh, one is uh, a reminder that as was the case last week, and as will be the case next Sunday for the final time, Financial Secretary Pat Herb will be down in the kitchen right at the end of worship with financial statements, statements of giving from the year just completed. Um, most of us anymore don't really achieve any benefit with taxes uh, because of those, but still, for your records, they are important and for our record keeping as well. And so if you would please be sure to stop into the kitchen downstairs. When you get to the bottom of the steps, head back the hallway and the first door to the right. The, the conference room is on the opposite side, kitchen on the right, and Pat will be there uh, for a few minutes to hand those statements out. Again, next week, one final time, and then the rest will be mailed. But being that it's helpful to save as much postage as possible, uh, please stop and pick those up. Uh, and then this afternoon council meeting, um, as, as maybe council members already saw in an email this morning, and if not, it's, it's in your inbox, we did decide to move to Zoom only today. Um, the weather in the later afternoon, early evening is just looking a little sketchy, maybe an inch of snow, right in that 3 o'clock to about 8 o'clock time frame. Maybe nothing, and we may all be sitting and Zooming and looking at the sunshine, but we thought since we already had a couple of folks, Roy and I felt, uh, who were going to be on Zoom anyway, it might just be as, as easy to all connect if we all are on Zoom and can see and hear each other uh, with that. So again, council members, you have uh, a resending of the Friday email, which does include the Zoom information, different from this morning. So don't, please don't try to use the same one that you used this morning. It would be the one that I sent to you on Friday. Tuesday evening, property committee, scheduled for 6.15. Uh, the plan being to meet downstairs in the Sunday school room. We'll simply distance ourselves and uh, gather there in person on Tuesday evening. Book discussion group looking a couple of weeks down the road. There are details about that here. Please check with Ann if you have any um, further questions about the next one coming up on February 7. Back on the table with the bulletins this morning are copies of the annual report, which were shared last week in hard copy. So if you didn't get one last week, if you, you know, would like to have one in addition to the e-copy you may have gotten, they're back there on the table. And uh, we will have them downstairs as well. If you happen to stop by during the week sometime, you'll be able to pick them up down by the guest book. There are also copies of the handout that Vincent prepared for our lectors, just in case you didn't get a hard copy of that as a lector for the coming year. Those uh, also are back there on the table as well for picking up. And finally then in our prayer list, um, which continues to grow rather long as you see, uh, just a couple of updates. Um, one, I had an update this morning from uh, Diane, who is Tim Ender's wife, and uh, she was saying that, that he is now breathing pretty much fully on his own. The, the respirator machine is done away with. He still has the trach, but he's now breathing under his own power, even without any assistance of any kind. He's also been approved now for swallowing, so uh, he is able to take solid food, which is, again, a great step forward. And so now the, the big project is going to be working on just getting his legs and everything strengthened for being able to, to come home, which is the goal, um, hopefully, before too long. And Diane mentioned that if, that if cards are being sent, if you could please send them to their home, where Tim is located, they uh, have uh, fairly strict policies about what gets put on walls and what can be in the room and so forth. And so the better, or the preferred thing is for Diane to bring them, share them with her loved one, and then take them back home. So if sending a card, please do that. And she did say thank you to the folks who have been sending cards, as you do so well. Thank you for that. Uh, Dana Clauser, as we uh, note when we went to press, we didn't have an update, but uh, Diana, uh, Dana did indeed come home uh, as scheduled, same day, and is recuperating at home, and I believe is joining us on Zoom this morning. So welcome to Dana. And uh, Luann Ressler, Dana's sister, 
sort of taken up the baton this week for surgery. Uh, Luann, as noted in the bulletin, is heading on Thursday over to Penn State Holy Spirit for a hip replacement surgery planned for a couple of days in the hospital before coming home again. So please update your prayers and do please continue those prayers. And uh, with that, uh, any other announcements for the good of the order before seeing none? Over to Judy for our prelude this Lord's Day. Please stand and join with me in the order for confession and forgiveness this third Sunday after Epiphany. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the Lord of Israel, who comes to set us free, the mighty Savior who comes to show mercy, the dawn from on high who guides us into peace. Amen. Amen. Let us now come before God in confession. To you, O God, we lift up our souls. You know us through and through. We confess our sins to you. Remember not our sins. Remember us with your steadfast love. Show us your ways, teach us your paths, and lead us in justice and truth for the sake of your goodness in Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Brothers and sisters, come with joy and draw water from the well of salvation. Remember the gift of baptism. Our sin is washed away in the name of Jesus. We belong to Christ. We are anointed to serve. Stand up and raise your heads. The reign of God is near. Amen. You may be seated as we sing together.
the refining fire of the Holy Spirit, and the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, be with you all. And also, and also with you. With you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord God, you have caused the Holy Scriptures to be written for the nourishment of your people. Grant that we may hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that comforted by your promises, we may embrace and forever hold fast to the hope of eternal life through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now I call on my sister in Christ, Rayanne, who again has disappeared from there to there. Rayanne, thank you. have returned and rebuilt Jerusalem. Now Ezra the priest reads the law of Moses to them in the public square. When they hear it, they weep for their sins and for the long years in exile. But Ezra reminds them that the joy of the Lord is your strength. All the people of Israel gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. According to the priest, Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. In the presence of the men and the women and those who could, who could understand and the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord and the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of the God with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the Lord, of the law. Then he said to them, go your, we, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine, and said for portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Here ends the first week. Now let's read responsibly to Psalm 19 here. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims its maker's handiwork. One day tells this tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard. Their sound has gone out into all lands, and their message to the ends of the world, where God has pitched a tent to the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. 
It goes forth from the heavens and to the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are just and the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to all of us. The fear of the God is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true, true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much shining gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey and the gold. By them also your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can detect one of those offenses? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Our second reading for today comes from 1 Corinthians Chapter 12, verses 12 through 31a. The apostle and pastor Paul uses the metaphor of the human body to describe how intimately connected we are in the church. For this struggling congregation in Corinth, Paul delivers a vital message of unity that is a mark of the church today. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body through many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink from one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need for you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are dispensable, and those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has arranged the body, giving greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body. But the members may have the same care for one another, if one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church, 
first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. But are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret, but strive for the greater gifts? Here ends that second reading. Please stand if you're able to do so. We read this morning from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke in the fourth chapter. Glory Lord to you, you Lord. O Lord. Luke tells us, Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and he was given the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you, O Christ. You may be seated once again. that Paul shares with those Christians at First Church Corinth in what we think of as chapters 12 and then 13 of this book of 1 Corinthians are probably right at the top as being some of the very most important words that he writes anywhere in Scripture. And so backing up, if you, if you keep in mind the fact that most of what we call the New Testament at least by the number of books, maybe not the number of pages, it's a little debatable, but based on the number of books, Paul is responsible for more of the New Testament than any other single author. Paul has his stamp all over the books that we know as the New Testament, all 27 of them. And Paul says a lot of important things in a lot of places. We'd be hard-pressed to fault the one that is right at the very front of our church and that I so frequently highlight. That one from his letter to the Romans in the 8th chapter, where he utters those unforgettable words about how nothing, anywhere, anytime, can ever separate us from the love of God. And those, and there are many other remarkable ones. But what I would say is when we dial it back a bit from the big question about how is it that we relate to God and God accepts and loves us, which clearly those words talk about, when we bring it more into, so what do we do as the people whom God has made God's own, right? Once God has said, never gonna let you go, and we live together in that news, well, what does that look like? And what do we do? And in that regard, I think, very clearly the words of Paul this morning and the ones coming up next Sunday as well following them are as important as any anywhere. Now if, if you remember, I've said it many, many times, so hopefully it rings a bell somewhere, that the Corinthian church, which simply means the Christian church in the city of Corinth, 
Corinth was an ancient city in, in Greece. Um, many people would liken it to the role that New York City plays today. It was one of the greatest shipping ports in the world known at that time, um, which made it a very cosmopolitan place. Just like today, if you walk around the streets of New York City anywhere, especially Manhattan, you'll hear all kinds of different languages. You'll see people that look very different from you. So it would have been in that time in the city of Corinth, much the same kind of thing. And there were all kinds of competing uh, messages about various gods that went along with being such a cosmopolitan place. Many were the temples to various sorts of gods, uh, male and female and, and those in between. So the Christians who were living in Corinth, the Christians who made up the community of Jesus there, had a, a lot of challenges. They had a lot of things they were up against in being faithful Christians. And so to get back to my point that I was making, you may remember my saying many times that this meant that they also had pretty much every problem in the book. They were, they were battling against a lot of things, but a part of that was that they as a Christian congregation, you name it, they were struggling with it. <laughs> From the strangest to the most every day, they had issues. And so Paul is writing this letter that we know as 1 Corinthians in response to a lot of problems that have been expressed to him. People, basically, the leaders in the congregation say, Paul, help! We got all this stuff going on. What do we do? And please, you know, be specific. Tell us what exactly, how to handle these particular issues. And this likely was not his only letter that was addressing those things, but it is the one that we have. And so he gets very, very practical. And as you probably got a sense as Rayanne was, was sharing the reading with you, the issue that Paul is dealing with today is the fact that people are so fragmented in that Christian congregation in Corinth, even polarized, we might say. They are um, dividing themselves up along all kinds of lines, um, slaves, and free people, slaves being of, of lesser stature, um, having less ability to be an active part of the congregational family than the wealthier people, and so they were being looked down <coughs> on. Um, there were just so many problems of immorality, amorality, divisiveness, and it is the divisiveness and the division that Paul addresses this morning. And so what I would like to do is just kind of walk us through briefly, um, consider it, I, I guess, in a sense, um, a, a bit of a Bible study, but an important one to my mind, where Paul um, puts it on the line and says very practically what it means to be a congregational family, to be a community of Jesus. So we're just going to start at the beginning. So if you want to get that celebrate up, up in front, or, uh, Rachel, if you can put that up on screen for the Zoom folks, or I should have mentioned that to you before. I, I'm always surprising Rachel with new things, and it's a testament to how great she is that she rolls with them so easily. But so, taking a look at the, at the first verses, Paul starts, Just as the body is one, and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. It's like, well, yeah, okay, Paul, yep body, many members, many parts, still one body, which is good. We need it to hold together. That's what we need in order to live. So it is, Paul says, with Jesus. In the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. We were all made to drink of one spirit. So right off the top, he says, just like your body, Many parts, but thankfully all holding together as God intends. So it is with the people who follow Jesus. And then he proceeds to say, even when it comes to two of the most polarizing, divisive categories of the time, slave versus free, Jew versus non-Jew, or Greek as a kind of shorthand. 
talk about people not necessarily seeing eye to eye, seeing things the same way. Paul says, doesn't matter. Name any division, any polarity you want, it is overcome in Jesus. So he goes on with that body thing, reading on. Indeed, the body, back to this, does not consist of one member, but of many. And then he gets kind of like crazy, right? It, you know, it's, it's funny talk almost. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, you know, again, that's kind of crazy to picture, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, on these amazing parts as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. So he says, just think about that, guys. How crazy would it be if we were to decide, or if any one part of our body were to take on a personality and say, you know, I'm really the only important part here, and on the other hand, well, because I'm not an eye, I really don't matter. That's ludicrous, right? You, you can't have a body as one giant eye or one giant ear. <coughs> Paul says just as ludicrous is the idea that we are, all of us, not an important part of the body that is the church. Reading on, verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body that we think less honorable we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member. Paul's way of saying, so no room for getting a big attitude. Including you, pastor, right? Because we pastors, maybe more than most, like to kind of, at times, get all high and mighty, you know, and think that somehow, you know, we sort of stand out above everyone else. And Paul says, uh-uh, uh-uh, nope, nope, nope. I, as a pastor, have one very specific, particular role that needs to be done and so God provides for that, but it's one part among the many parts. And by the same token, the person who speaks easily in front of others, who is an eloquent reader, who can teach a class, who can lead a meeting, that's wonderful. That's a great gift. Those are great gifts. But that does not in any way, shape, or form make those gifts or that person or those people any more important than the person who kind of quietly is a member and is a part of the work that gets done but doesn't get the attention. So there's no room for attitude of any kind, either feeling inferior or feeling superior. Paul says, no, just drop it. Think of the body. All the parts none of us want to do without any of them. And so it is with the people of God. He goes on to say, verse 25, This is so that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. We know the truth of that bodily, right? If one member suffers, oh my, you know, if I get a sore in the end of my finger, let's say, um, it has a way of like dominating my day. I can be having a great day and my brain can be doing things and my heart's beating and all kinds of good stuff going on. But if I have a break in my skin or something, this time of year, you know, you get those dry things going on and it starts to get sore, I'll tell you what, pretty much all the other parts, I'm glad they're still there doing their thing, but I'm not thinking about them much. I'm thinking about the end of my doggone finger. 
So Paul says, in the same way, as a member of this body that is a congregational family, we have that same kind of relationship. You know, we can't just say, oh, boy, so-and-so is having a tough time. Boy, that's their problem. Doesn't mean anything to me. It's our job to care. And likewise, when someone celebrates a great honor, you know, it's not a place to say, oh, who do they think they are? Or, oh, I wish I had that or anything of the kind. It's, yeah, way to go. That's wonderful. Congratulations. And I have to say that among the many wonderful things that I see as a part of being a part of this wonderful congregational family, that ever since day one, when I set foot in this place, so it was nothing I created or, you know, made happen, that's been happening. You all are amazing when it comes to caring and sharing for the person who is in pain, for taking that seriously and feeling that pain and reaching out, likewise for celebrating with the person who's having some particularly wonderful experience. That's something that I hear again and again and again from people who come to visit or who just have a connection to the congregation but belong to another congregational family. This, this place is known. Every congregation has the things it's known for, right? That is most definitely one for which you all are known. So coming down the home stretch, verse 27. Now you, so Paul finally gets it specific. He says, okay, now you get this whole thing about the body, all the parts, the parts suffering together, celebrating together, all of that. Now, here's the point. You are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And just like with the body body, God has appointed in the church Various body parts. Paul says, first, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. In other words, just like God makes sure that the body has all the parts it needs to live and do its amazing work, God has seen to it that a congregational family has the parts that are needed to make it work. And as you go down that list, you know, again, think broadly. And I'm sure each and every one of us, and if you need any help with that, please come see me. And I'll be happy to talk with you about where I see your gifts fitting, because they're there, guaranteed. And then he closes, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret? He doesn't exactly answer the question, but clearly the implication is, well, heck no. But he says, that's the way God intends it. If the whole church were an apostle, where would we be? If the whole church were a pastor, where would we be? If the whole church were someone who is more comfortable being a part of a group rather than leading, where would we be? But as it is, God makes sure the parts that are needed are there. And then he ends by saying, but strive for the greater gifts. And uh, without spoiling any anticipation for next week, but of course you can look ahead and on the celebrate, it says what we're gonna be reading next week. But as you might guess, next week, we read what follows, and more to come about that. But you, my brothers and sisters, are the body. And when I look out, I see an amazing, and when I think of the people joining us on Zoom, I see this amazing variety, you know, of forms and ages and genders and gifts and strengths and weaknesses and brokenness and wholeness and all those wonderful things. That is as God intends, brothers and sisters in Christ, thanks be to God. Amen. And so we take a break in the normal flow of things.
to uh, take some time to install our brand new members of Congregational Council. And um, again, in these times we're going to adapt it a bit. Normally what we'd be doing is getting everybody together right there up at the altar railing and we'd be huddled there close together. But uh, what I'll instead ask for is that as I call out your name, as I read your name, if you would please stand where you are and we'll conduct the installation from there. Let me get my book. I meant to bring it before, I forgot it. Okay. So it is my joy to remind you all, speaking of the various parts of the body, right? That the following people have been elected by this congregational family to positions of leadership on our congregational council. We give thanks for their willingness to serve. In baptism, we are welcomed into the body of Christ and sent to share in the mission of God. We rejoice now that these brothers and sisters will be leaders in our common life and our mutual ministry as a congregational family. And so I'll ask them again to please stand as I read their name. Carl Baumgartner, Gail Billow, Courtney Foreman, Joshua Paul, and Craig Peters. And there they are. And guess what? A reading from 1 Corinthians. A little reminder, but it's a part of the installation. We've just talked about this. Paul says, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of services, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So, sisters and brothers, you have been elected to this position of leadership and trust in this congregational family. You are to see that the deeds and words of this household of faith bear witness to God, who gathers us into one together with the whole church. You are to seek to involve all members of this congregation in worship, learning, witness, service, and support, so that the mission of Christ is carried out in this congregation, in the wider church, in this community, and in the whole world. You are to be faithful and diligent in your serving, that the Spirit who empowers you may be glorified. And you are to be examples of faith active in love, fostering peace, harmony, and mutual understanding in this congregational family. And so now I ask you, on behalf of your sisters and brothers in Christ here gathered, will you accept and faithfully carry out the duties of this office to which you have been elected? And if so, we'll ask, we'll start over with Courtney and work our way across to Craig. Please answer if you would, one at a time. I will, and I ask God to help me. And people of God, I ask you, will you support these, our elected leaders? And will you share in the mutual ministry that Christ has given to all of us who are the baptized? If that is our intention, once again, let us answer together. We will, and we ask God to help us. We will, and we ask God to help us. Folks, I now declare you installed as members of the Congregational Council of the St. John Congregational Family. May Almighty God bless you and direct your days and your deeds in peace that you may prove faithful servants of Christ. Amen. And how about a nice round of applause? <laughs> and we will be gathering this afternoon on Zoom as we have our first meeting together. So thank you all and you may be seated. And with that, we will turn in the bulletin to the new creed, uh, and we will together make that confession of who we are and whose we are as the people of God. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit, we trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, 
to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. And we'll go over to Judy for our anthem now as we receive the morning offering from the back. <coughs> Please stand as we pray. <clears throat> the Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance, so we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. O oh God, you reveal yourself to us in the reading of Scripture. Fulfill your word through the faithful witness of your church. Send us out to bring your liberating good news to all people. God of grace, hear our prayer. All creation proclaims your handiwork. Teach us to love the intricate and beautiful bodies that you have created. Bless tiny insects, enormous whales, and every creature in between. Sustain species at risk of extinction. God of grace, you are prayer. O oh God, you desire that there be no dissension among us, where we are divided in our society, nation, or world. Come quickly, we pray, to reunite us into one body. We pray at this time, dear God, that you would be with those who lead us in the important work of education at all different levels, near and far, those who must make difficult decisions about the balancing of safety and learning, but of course also the students and families who deal with those decisions and who frequently need 
or frequently find their lives uh, changed drastically even day by day. Please help them, we pray, to find that right and best balance. Thinking of education leaders, we do pray for our church-affiliated institutions at Susquehanna University, Gettysburg College, and the United Lutheran Seminary at Gettysburg in Philadelphia, as well as those members of our congregational family who are students in higher education. We lift up to you this day, Lily, Rayanne, Gracie, Ryan, Allison, Owen, Cameron, Valerie, Nicholas, and Kristen. We pause also to think of those who are leaders and frontline servants in the important work of healing and in the medical arts of many kinds. Please continue to sustain them all, dear God, now as we come up soon on two years of walking with the global pandemic. Please be with on our prayer list, Paulette, Jenna, Jody, Gwen, Peyton, Kristen, Sarah Schaefer, Stephen, Michelle, Joanne, David, Todd, Joshua, Elena, Courtney Pfeiffer, Sarah Paul, Bobby, Angela, Cindy, Whitney, Haley, Shannon, Courtney Miller, Ronnie, Heidi, Shawnita, Rose, Nicole, Tanya, Sarah, Abigail, Robert, Courtney Foreman, Glenn, Anne, Olivia, Seth, Rachel, Gary, Timothy, Gabrielle, Daniel, Rochelle, Gerald, Brett, and Chelsea. Dear God, grant your healing grace, ease conflict, dispel violence, and where it happens, please bring an end or prevent all war. God of grace, hear our prayer. Anoint with your spirit all who seek your favor. Grant provision and justice for people living in poverty, people living with disability, those living with pain or those living under oppression, those who struggle with brokenness of body, mind, or spirit of any kind. We lift up to you now at this time, Louise, Judy, Timothy, Jane, Warren, Richard, Marzette, Dana, Cora, Joyce, Ken, Donna, Luann, Lois, and these persons we each name now in the privacy of our hearts before you. God of grace, hear our prayer. We ask that you would build up the body of Christ in this place, O God. Bless the variety of ministries in this congregational family, especially all those who serve on congregational council as we reorganize for a new year later today. Empower us all to freely welcome and deeply value each person who enters into worship and ministry among us. God of grace, hear our prayer. In thanksgiving, we lift before you the saints for whom the promise of salvation has now been fulfilled. Tend to those who mourn. Bring us, we pray, together in your everlasting glory. God of grace, hear our prayer. prayer. Since we have such a great hope in your promises, O God, we lift these and all of our prayers to you in confidence and faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us to pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may God direct our ways in peace, make us abound in love for one another and for all, and strengthen our hearts until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. You may again be seated as we sing our concluding song. <laughs>
reminder, right after the dismissal, um, I'll extinguish the candles as Judy begins her postlude, and then, as you wish, you're welcome to make your way downstairs, and I'll look forward to seeing you outside. May not have long extended conversations if it's still pretty cold out there, huh? but I will see you there. And now, go in peace. Christ is with us. We, we will. will. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.